All right, and with this first section that we have, again, what you need to do with everything that we're doing it is think, how does this relate to us as Americans? Yeah, that might be a little bit selfish, but we as Americans were a bit on the selfish side anyways, and think of ourselves first in here. Now, first question on there, what is the difference between immigration and migration? Mark? Uh, immigration is like where some, is like where they leave from one place and go to another, and migration is just kind of moving around as like a constant state. Mm, sort of, Jamie? Um, is immigration just illegally moving? Like no, you can be legal. Yeah, I know you're okay, well, if you're moving, like you're going to a different place, like an alien, like you're moving to a different place that you're well, not. Well, migrating is a different place, too. Oh, yeah. Like everybody. Yes. Yeah. And that's actually a better way to do it. And actually, we'll, we'll see here. Uh, immigration is where people come from another place that's already basically civilized. Uh, has a civilization there, whereas immigration is where they come and basically settle the area. Well, that's sort of that, except for the, civil that the civilized side may not matter on there. One last one. I think migration is like an over time thing. Like it happens, it can happen fast or slow, but it's kind of like sometimes, sometimes not. Now here's where now I always remember it this way. Do birds immigrate or do they migrate? They migrate. They migrate. So, so what is migrate then? It's temporary. It's more temporary. So what's immigration? Or long term. More permanent. When you think about it, people, we are a nation of immigrants. And even when we go to our very first people, the ones that we were talking about that were coming from Asia, they were immigrants. So our first Native Americans are that. Now. Kind of going with that story, how did the first people get there? And we had on there the land bridge we talked about a second ago, the land bridge over the Bering Strait, uh, approximately 20 to 40,000 years, give or take three days. Um, but that's where we kind of, we don't know for sure when the first ones were there. They come and they, set, and they start spreading out. You will have these tribes. Do you think there may have been drama 20,000 years ago with a group of people? Mm -hmm. And so, when, and what would happen is if there was something, Americans came down, came up through probably the Yucatan Peninsula into the Caribbean, and settled from us from the south, not the north. Um, if any of you ever went to the Crystal River um, Indian mounds, there are two stilies that are there. There are two stones. Um, even though mounds are like for the north, the stones and what they did there, Indian tribes to the north of us don't have it. It is the tribes to the south in the Caribbean. Plus, some of our tribes are going to be known for doing things that are more like the Caribbean. No question over here. Right at the table. Okay. All right, so we have the Bruins. There we go. <laughs> that's a pretty good looking name. That, that's a good looking name. That's a, can you give us some names down there? On video. Yeah, come on. Don't be shy. <laughs> there we go. All right. How did hunter gatherers get their food? They hunted and gathered them. Yes, this is tough. <laughs> and you thought geography was tough and world history was. What does it mean by gathering? What are they gathering? Like Fruits, sticks, sticks, and resources. Plants. Yeah, whatever. It might be the fruits. It might be, it might be roots. It might be fungus. Mushrooms. Yeah, mushrooms. Yeah, you have something that has grown. You figure out what you can and can't eat. Here, here we have it. You might be gathering, because you don't actually hunt oysters. You gather oysters, or you're actually, yeah, I guess you technically could be hunting for scallops, but you wouldn't be hunting for them. So you have that. Now, a subsistence farmers. They're doing enough farming for who? Themselves and the family. Yeah, themselves and the family. It's a very small group of people. And so as we have kind of advanced, they learn, and it might, it might be by accident. Um, some of you have gone and you ate watermelon and you spit out the seeds and you notice later on watermelon plants growing. Well, they might have noticed that one time when they came across some watermelons or pumpkins or something and, and they carried them with them a little ways and they ate and then some time later they came and where they were that didn't have watermelons now has it. And they might put two and two together. Well, that's where we have it. Just like I didn't go over the development of language, but when our cavemen were doing their grunts, all right, one grunt might mean a woolly mammoth. But two grunts together, a little bit different sound, means saber-toothed tiger. So we developed language over, over that time period. Um, but we, now, as you go and we make more and more, we will develop city-states. 
Now in world history, you learned about the ones in the Tigris Euphrates Valley, the Nile River Valley, the Yangtze River, the Indus River, and those city states. But in North and South America, we will have it develop. But in North and South America, what crop would make it where we will have city states when we got to got more of it? Maize or corn. Okay, maize, which today we think of as corn. Because that is something that could be stored. Where in Egypt, they have wheat and barley. Um, now, we will not have near as many animals that are domesticated in North and South America as what they would have in the Fertile Crescent. Um, a lot of things weren't there. Even though horses were originally in North America, they died off about, about 10, 12,000 years ago. So, and maybe some of them were killed off. It may have been an ice age that came across. But they were not able to domesticate very many animals there. Llama, llamas were some of the few that, that we would have. So what exactly were city states? Like well, this is where we will have some of our first civilizations that come about, which okay. kind of the next one. And this is where you kind of look at it. Again, the world history side, we're not worried on our point of view for Egypt and Indus those, because we are looking again, what's happening, and what would become America, or at least the Americas, which are early civilizations or city-states that we will have. Um, first one that you may, may have known of was the Amit, which then will develop into the Mayans. And I know a lot of you want to really do historical research during spring break on the Mayans, and you are trying to tell your parents that you need to go to Cancun for historical research during spring break. Because so you need to go and, and research on the Mayan pyramids that are outside of Cancun, Mexico, in that area. Uh, there. The Aztecs in Central America, and we're going to come back to them and the conquistadors, but a lot of you know of Cortez and what he did. The Inca down in South America as they, these are all developing that they have. Um, but for <laughs> the Americas, and this is where we look on it. Now notice in here on the PowerPoint and in your notes, what's different about the Anase and Hokumen compared to the others? Are they larger? More native like Well, on here, what's different with the writing? Bolded. It's bolded and underlined. So for American history, what's more important for you to know? Okay, yes, Aztecs were more important probably in history than that, but for us in America, this is our first American tribe. Those of you that know the Navajo and the Hopi tribes, this is their ancestors in the Southwest. They learned how to make adobe bricks. And this is where we will have, have some of those. Now, they, they did not develop the huge city-states because they could not grow as many crops um, there as you could south of that. The Mississippian culture, any guess of where the Mississippian culture was located near? Mississippi. And not the state of Mississippi, well, but the river. the river, so in the valley. Yeah. Well, it's not the first American tribe, but this is that was a tribe that was in, in the Americas, um, and that would be one of the civilizations that would come about early on. Now, the Mississippi culture, they were mound builders. Why do they build mounds? Sometimes bury the dead, but that actually isn't their number one reason. They're home. Make houses. Home. So they live, they live in a mound? Well, they it's used it. Like. It's been done before. <laughs> you can make a dugout, but it, I mean, that would be a lot of work. Sometimes it was for religious reasons. Now, it was because of home, but what they would do is they would build their home. One of the most famous mounds, and this is where you see how steep this is, it's in Illinois. Uh, this mound is actually almost a square mile. There were no tractors to build this. There were no excavators or dump trucks. There were no horses or donkeys or mules to help with this. Think how big this is, and it stretches for a long way. It's on the edge of where the Mississippi, close to where the Mississippi and Ohio River come together. Now, they would have their city on top of that mound. What happens most springs to those rivers? They flood. They flood. Is flooding good for farmers in those days? Yes. Yeah. 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 Remember, and you probably had it more with Egypt. Mm -hmm. Why did they like the Ohio so, River or the Nile River Valley? Here, here, so, yeah. It's so. Right, the silt would come in, and that's fertilizer. 
You want to live near your fields, but you want to live where your house floods. So if you build a mound, and for a couple of weeks a year, it floods around there, and when the waters recede, is it easy to farm then down here? So that's why those cultures flow. Now, for us here in Citrus County, we have the Crystal River Indian Mountains, and some of you have, have been there. Now, some of them were built for homes, and the higher the mound, the more important you were. There were some of those where someone said for burying the dead. If you actually are there, there's this one circle, and people actually all up and down the coast would bring their dead to bury it at Crystal River, and there's this ring where they know that there is over 300 bodies that have been buried there. Most of the mounds though at Crystal River are what we call midden mounds. Remember from your fifth grade or Florida history class before what a midden mound is? Yeah, it's shells. It's a trash pile. What what type of food would they gather a lot of at Crystal River? Clams, uh, clams, yeah. yeah. oysters, shellfish. You gonna go dump it back out in the Gulf, or are you just gonna throw a pile in it? So, and those bounds build up and build up. The biggest mound of all, which actually is at, at Crystal River, is this one. If you're ever on the top of it, it, it's pretty high looking over it. And half of it's already been dug, was dug up in the 1920s to be used for field dirt. But that was actually where they had a religious temple. There. But that's where we had some of our mound builders closer by. Now, we know they even traded with them, and there was a trade network um, that they would use going all the way up into um, the, the Great Lakes. Um, Great Lake Indians would use oyster shells for money. Would it take a lot to get an oyster shell at that time period up to Michigan? Mm -hmm. So that would be rare there. All right, how would y'all like oysters to be for money? I mean, you head out to the Gulf today. All right, that's where we'll stop for today. There are three things that are like kind of reoccurring things that you must know. Um, when it comes for our Native Americans. The first is what amazing crop made it where our Indians had civilization. Maize. Maize. Okay. Maize or corn. When they had a surplus of that, that is where we will have these city states go. Number two thing is the fact that when we talk about Native Americans for this time period and for the next couple hundred years, we're not talking about one group of people. It is actually many, many different nations. It's not one Indian nation. Even when we look here in Florida, we will say that the Timucual Indians were the ones that lived in this area from here up to kind of southeast Georgia, north of Jacksonville. But that was actually over 20 different individual tribes. The Indians that lived right here in Inverness were a different tribe than the Ocali tribe, which was a very big tribe. Any guess where the Ocali tribe okay. was? And then when they had the Kingdom of the Sun. So that's where <laughs> that was. Now, they are not one united group. They are fighting each other um, along the way. And I have the question, how would that hurt them against the European invaders? Because they're all like trying to fight them off on their own. They can't because they're 10 times bigger. And this is what will end up happening. What if all the Indian tribes decided to work together and get rid of the Europeans that they vastly outnumbered? Probably would have won. Yeah. yeah, they probably would have won. Meanwhile, we have it where they're fighting each other, and the Europeans use this. Um, I think I have told some of you there one of the classes last nine weeks, I think I had said about the story, the real story behind Thanksgiving. Yes, the Indians and pilgrims had a dinner together, but they were celebrating the fact of with that tribe that lived there and they had fought uh, one of their ancient rivals, they got the pilgrims to fight with them using their firearms to go and try to eliminate the other Indian tribe. And it was a victory dinner where the pilgrims and one tribe had defeated another tribe out there. And this is where, whether we're talking about English, French, there, that will have. Um, and that is the second reoccurring theme that, that we will have on here. Now, kind of another thing in history to look at um, here. There is one group of Indians that a lot of times are pointed to. And those of you that are from New York, Canada area, you might be familiar with the Mohawk, Oneida, or the, the two most popular tribes. But the Iroquois Indians, these tribes made together a confederation. Vocabulary words you must know. Confederation is a loose union. 
They join together, they have a common purpose. So they all decide to work together. Even though it was seven or six different tribes together, they, they work together for common purposes. The reason why I kind of point this out is sometimes we will have what's called revisionist history. Today, there are some historians that will write and say that we based some of our American government on the fact that those Indian tribes worked together, and when we had 13 individual states come together and we made the Articles of Confederation, we were kind of copying what the Native Americans were doing there, which sounds really good, except for did our founding fathers really look too much upon respect of what the Native Americans were doing? Uh, no. mm -hmm. And that's where, yeah, it fits in when you write that in history, but it really, there were some that kind of looked at it, but they looked at other confederations. If all the Native Americans were looking for like, equal rights and to go against the European invaders, why didn't they like, come together? Well, and this is where the part of it was there's ancient rivalries. I mean, if you had been enemies with another group for thousands of years, sometimes a common enemy does help, and there are a few times. But we're going to find when we get to American history, there are a few times that tribes come together. Um, some of you may pick in the people reports to come stuff. All right, he is an Indian that brings several different tribes together, and they win. But then they split apart again. We will have a guy by the name of Sitting Bull. Remember him? He brings several tribes together, and they win. And at that time, I mean, the Battle of Little Bighorn was kind of seen in the newspapers of the East, kind of the way we look at 9-11 today. But what did those tribes do after they won the Battle of Little Bighorn? Yeah, they split up, and then what did the U.S. Army do? <laughs> yeah, went over each, each one of them. So that's why it's kind of, yeah, there are times they get together, but a lot of times they won't. I mean, it's kind of like us. I mean, do, would you all really, are there a lot of things that you all have that are common problems that Crystal River and Lacanto students have? Yeah, like, can you really work good. with them? I mean, yeah. the mullets and the dirt farmers, could you really actually get together with them? By the way, Jocelyn, both Crystal River and Citrus makes fun of Lacanto. I, I know. So. <laughs> All right, here's a map for things. No, you don't have to know, but some of you, um, some of you know more of this. Back in fifth grade, you might have had various sayings for these different Indian tribes. Um, the Timucua, like I said, that was the Indians that are here. It kind of spreads in here. They have them a little bit further north. But you notice, what tribe is not listed on this map for Florida? Why are symbols on there? Bobby Bowden not come yet? <laughs> the Seminole tribe was not around yet. It was not a, a tribe at the time of Columbus. Uh, what will end up happening as time is these tribes will end up being eliminated. Um, there, and there aren't very many Indians left in Florida. And as the American government is trying to eliminate other Indian tribes with the Creek, the Choctaw, the Chickasaw, many of them would run away, that's what Seminole meant, run away to Florida, um, and they account. Um, the last of the Timucual Indians actually left in 1763 when the Spanish left Florida after they had surrendered on the French and Indian War. Um, and actually even showing with the, where you would ask them about, even with the Confederation, during the French and Indian War, the French and the English split up the Iroquois Confederation. Some of, that, some of those tribes ended up fighting with the English, some with the French. Um, great movie to watch if you like some blood and guts and a lot of beautiful scenery is Last of the Mohicans mm -hmm. um, there. And that is actually showing a lot of that where they are split up. All right, Florida tribes. We do have three tribes in Florida. The three, and this is, again, this is Florida history. This is nothing with AP, but it is something that you should know with your own history. Down in South Florida, we had the Calusa Indians. Um, the Calusa are the ones that you see a lot of pictures of things, and this is one of them that we have. They were seen as giants. And the Spanish, the way they wrote about them. Now, as we have dug up bodies of Calusa Indians, we know that they were pretty decent size. Average size for them was somewhere close to six foot. Where like average size today for males is 5'10 to 5'11. So they were pretty much close to what average size males are today. So why the Spanish write about them as being such giants? Compared to the 
Oh, they're even shorter than that. Some some of the tallest span. Chef five six was one of the explorers. I know it was five six, and he was actually the tallest guy. The average height for the Spanish conquistadors and all was usually five to five two. Wow. Is there, uh, everyone signed up for all three? No. Oh wait, we need three. I might send two. Three, yeah. Oh, just kidding. Thank you. Um, but that's where for now the Calusa. So they were taller. So the Spanish were looking up at them. The other thing is, if you try to see, they wore their hair up. So it'd be kind of like if you see someone that's big, but they have a big hair. So that adds a couple more inches. They were very healthy. Now this art makes them look even more muscular because the time period of this art was a time period that was the Renaissance, and they would make things. And this is a time period that that more bulk was seen as, as beauty, so that's where they had it. But they were actually taller. They were actually more muscular than the Spanish. Why? They were. Actually, they probably did less work than the Spanish. Healthier. All right, they're healthier. Why are they healthier when they're living in Fort Myers and the Caloosahatchee River area? The better food. Variety. If you're living in Fort Myers area, Sanibel Island, actually it'd be on the inshore part of that. Your diet's gonna be a lot of seafood. You have a mixture of other things in there, but is seafood healthy? Not all of it. Most yeah. of it, unless you cook it with a lot of butter. Yeah. Or, but this is where for the shellfish that, that you have, most of that is very healthy. Meanwhile, what was the staple for the Spanish for generation after generation? Like bread and right. Well, a lot of the a lot of the grains that you would have, did they have a lot of variety in their diet? No. no. no that's where it end up. That they kind of end up. Meanwhile, the clues, and actually, this is where we kind of look at for for the Indians for Florida. They were pretty healthy when they come. Do we have pretty good weather here? Yeah. 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 I mean, we've been complaining about being cold the last two mornings. It was it was 50 degrees this morning. <laughs> All right. Yesterday, yesterday was depending on where you're living, somewhere between 30 and 34. No, it was right. cold. Um, yeah. It's cold to us, but all right, that's compared to other places. Not so bad. All right, the area then that includes us, and again, it kind of goes in a swatch across this area. Area um, there, kind of if you think, just go 100 miles on both sides of the Suwannee River. On um, there would be the Timucua. Some of you that had played sharks or the, the storm um, football. And storm cheerleading, what conference were you in? Tanuka. Right. And it's pronounced, I've heard it Temuqua and Tamukian. Oh. And I, I, actually, I've I heard it both. both my, I usually call it Tamukian, but most people in this area call it Temuqua. The Panhandle area, we will have the Appalachie. Those of you that know Appalachicola River um, in that area, and they would live in that area. They were actually more like the Mississippian cultures out um, there. Meanwhile, I don't have all of them. We have the Tequesta Indians, the Gina and the Ayaz Indians that live down on the coast where today it would be Martin County, Palm Beach County, Broward, Dade County. These Indians are definitely a lot closer to our Caribbean and the Indians from Mexico. Um, Glenn, you may not like being the oldest son of the chief for, and I can't remember if this is Gina or the Ayaz, because the oldest, the firstborn son of the chief is sacrificed to the gods. <laughs> so there, you wanted to be number two. Hunter, congratulations. <laughs> All right, uh, there, because you're now the chief. Uh, and they had some strange ways of honoring their dead. All right, you really love grandma, so to show part of the grandma, you might have some of her fingers on a necklace or something that you wear after she dies. Um, but this is where, and then some of you know the Aztecs, some of the things they had. All right, now we come to Citrus County. First of all, if you were 500 years ago, you're in Citrus County, where would be in our county the best place to live? Chris right here. Citrus Oaks. Citrus Oaks. Citrus County. Crystal River. You would actually want to be over on the coast. Almost as the Crystal River, Chazawiska. Why? Food. Water. Okay. You have food. food. Yes, you have water. Yes, the lake has water, but any of you that do some fishing, are you going to catch more fish in the salt water than in the fresh water lake? Yeah. And possibly some bigger things. Yeah. And there. Now, there's other things that you have. Deer, squirrels, raccoons, bear, 
panther at that time that you could also eat. They had them loaded in Homosassa, Chazowitzka, and Crystal River also. So you would have the land animals, but you would have more things. You also have, well, actually, what is, before I get to that, what is the biggest downfall that you would have of living anywhere in Citrus County 500 years ago? Boring. What do we do with boring? <laughs> well, you say that's no moving. So. Yeah. Hurricanes. Yeah, not hurricanes, although that would not be a real it would be a little problem that would be a big problem. Mosquitoes. Yeah, mosquitoes. Uh, yeah. There were a lot more swamps. We did not have trucks going in spring. How bad do you think mosquitoes were 500 years ago? I don't really know. Kind of a and if you lived in Crystal River and on those mounds, it makes it even better. In the evening during the summer, you have a sea breeze for the first couple of miles that comes in every single day. That breeze keeps the mosquitoes away uh, a lot more. Um, there during the winter, you don't have the mosquitoes as much. Um, there you do have um, the noceums over there, but but that's where also the breeze keeps the noceums off. So that's where it's another reason it happened. Plus, yesterday we had our cavemen go and, and kill Bruin um, here, but we end up having having other things. A bear would be one of the biggest animals you can eat. Would you want to try to kill a bear with yeah. spear, bows and arrows, knives? Mm -mm. oh, yes. What in Crystal River might be a little easier and provide probably even more meat than a bear? A manatee. All right, there you go. And yes. I missed out. A manatee would kill a bear? No. <laughs> no, Bruin. I know that none of you are lazy, but you are efficient. And this is where our sea cows are manatees. Yes, I know the Citrus County Economic Development Committee does not want to have people talk about killing manatees. But if you were a hundred, five hundred years ago, do you think that it might be a little bit easier to get some extra food from a sea cow? Yeah. No, they're ferocious. <laughs> As they swim up to you, and then if you need to pull closer to the village, you can have it where it's floating. It's easier to haul it in the water than dragging that bear. And you still, if you want bear, you can go off and hunt. And actually, they would send hunting parter parties to Gainesville. What's in Gainesville that they're going to eat and not Gator? Gate. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone been on Payne's Prairie? Oh, Prairie Hawk. Yeah, what? yeah, it's Buffalo. Buffalo were native in that area. So you could go and get Buffalo in Gainesville, which, again, is um, about 60 miles away from where the Indian mountains are. There. So you have variety. Plus, again, none of you are lazy, but you're efficient. You jump in your canoe if you want to do some easy hunting, and you hunt oysters. Gather a thought. Wow. That's your, or the hunting will be the scallops, because sometimes you have to swim a little bit to get <laughs> Mullet are a little bit easier fish to catch with nets than bass or brim. Um, yeah, there. Um, so that's why you kind of look at things in a different point of view, but that's why we would have smaller villages in other areas, but but this is where the coastal area is where we'd have them. So. All right, here's where we kind of look at. We're going to be looking at Africa and then Europe. It's a lot of things that you have in world history, but I need you to go, and now we're not world history. You have to think American histories. How are they, How is the things that contribute to us all right, in making for America on this? First of all, in world history last year, you should have learned a lot about these different trading kingdoms, and this is where we will have some of these but especially Mali will end up being one of the richest Islamic kingdoms that, that we will have. But these kingdoms in Africa, North Africa, are the ones that are in the Sahara Desert. They get rich because they're able to trade with both the tribes in the north on the Mediterranean and the tribes down on West Africa um, along the Atlantic. They're able to take technology from both and then they have superior technology. And what happens is we have all of these different tribes, and they are fighting each other at times, and sometimes, and some groups will dominate other areas. Now, we will end up having, with these different tribes, slavery. It is not the slavery, though, that a lot of you think of. If, let's say, we were a tribe, and Mr. Journey's class was a tribe, we would uh, go and fight them. If we were victorious, we would, we would be. 
some of them, not all of them, some of them would become slaves. All right, we might pick some of the more muscular men to do some of the work, physical work. Some of the guys here might pick some more attractive females. And they would come and they would be our slaves. Why are they our slaves? We defeated them. We conquered them. Now, here's where you have to look at things. So, I did not have it on. With this question here, how is slavery different than what it would be in the new world? First of all, we have them as slaves. Are they slaves forever? No. In fact, actually, over time, that we will allow them to be free. And when they're free, what if after they've been a slave for us, we say you're free, what if they decide they want to stay with us? We let them, and they become part of our tribe. Bruin, meanwhile, he's picked his slave woman there. And, with, and his slave woman ends up having a child. Is the child a slave, or is the child free? The child is free. The woman, is, it might even be his wife, might still be a slave, but the child is free. Did the child lose the battle? No, so it's not part. And eventually, that woman might become part of our tribe, may not be um, there, but that is where. So how is it that a person is a slave in ancient Africa? By defeat. Now, here's where you have to see with the big picture. In the New World, North and South America, how was a person a slave? They were bought. Right. They were bought, they're captured, they're sold, and it's race. And that is where it comes out that it's different. If Bruin is a plantation owner in South Carolina. No, I don't want to be that guy. I'll be and there is a female slave that then has a child that looks a lot like him. The child is a slave. The child is still a slave. And yes, this is one thing you're going to find that happens multiple times. Um, and I, and I, I kind of look back and think, what? Can you imagine if you were the wife of a plantation owner and you would see some of the slave children that have features of your husband? Kill that woman. Well, is it the woman's fault? Kill the child. Kill the child? Wow. <laughs> All right. But this is where. What about your husband is the one? All right. We've been to Africa before, now with Europe. One thing with the 1200, 1300s, 1400s. This is where there were all these, all kinds of kingdoms. But over this time period, these kingdoms would start joining together to become nations. Some did not develop as much. This is why by the time we get to the, the time of exploration, we won't have, have a Germany um, there, because Germany's still a whole bunch of kingdoms. We won't have a true Italy. There's still a bunch of, of little kingdoms. They will actually come about later in history when those kingdoms start coming together. Um, um, but that is why Portugal, Spain, France will end up emerging in here. But I have on there, what was the one unifying force of all of Europe? What is it? Catholicism. Right. Catholicism, Roman Catholic Church. Um, there. And who is the head of that church? The Pope. Right, the Pope. So this is why for time and time again, you will have it where the church is the one thing that would unify all of those kingdoms together. And... I say, how is this shown? How did the, the Roman Catholic Church show their power? About 20 sometimes. What? Crusades. Right, with the Crusades. The Pope would say, we want people to come. And yesterday, who was our priest in here? Okay, so our priest Brandon, all right, would go to his people and say, we need to. And would go to the king and say, we need our soldiers. We need a certain number of soldiers to come. Now, here's the part that we go when, we, when Europeans went to the Middle East. And for some of you, this is what is scary when you hear Silk Road brings back bad memories from AP World History. But the Silk Road had connected together the Middle East with, with the eastern part of Asia, and they had trading. And when the Europeans went and were usually defeated in the Crusades, they came across a lot of things that they really liked and found out that there were other parts of the world in the half. Um, one thing that will be the lasting impression on, on what will be the Americas will be they found sugar. And we as Americans, we, yes, we love sugar way too much. But the Europeans loved sugar. They really had not had sugar. 
when they came back to Europe and they had the sugar and they wanted more of it and they brought back some sugar cane and they grow very good. Why didn't it grow in Europe? In the most close to Europe. Where does sugar cane grow? Tropical? Yeah, more tropical. It's too cold. So that's why they couldn't have this. So they, they didn't find it. All right, now we're going to fast forward a little bit when the Spanish first arrived. Columbus arrives in what basically would be the Bahamas today. And then as they explore, it's the Caribbean. Guess what they stuck the Spanish planted a lot of after they found, whatever, after they got whatever gold or silver they could, what was their next thing that they did to make money? Sugar. Sugar. And then to kind of make this impact upon what would become, come for the Americas and the United States of America was, they would have to have people working on these sugarcane plantations. And the Native Americans were not very good workers on it because they kept running away or dying. So how did the Spanish then have workers to go and, and or where do they get the workers from to work on these sugarcane plantations? Slavery? Yeah, and this is where the slavery will come to America. Uh, there. Most of the slaves brought to Africa were not brought to what was the United States. So slavery was higher in the Caribbean. Um, there. For every slave that was brought to the 13 colonies, there was almost 10 times the amount that was brought to work on Caribbean plantations. Um, and we'll even see this. And then the English will be part of this because they will be bringing those slaves to the Caribbean. Um, and we'll, we'll find that the English, um, and even with the Puritans, a lot of these Puritans that are coming over for Christianity will move to the island of Barbados, which one of the main things there, the English will have the sugarcane plantations. So that's why I'm telling you that you have to kind of look back and see how does this relate for the Americas. All right, that's where sugar actually makes a big impact onto other, other things. Um, now with the Dark Ages. Um, and here, first of all, Marco. Oh. All right. Besides a great pool game, what is Marco Polo known for? Adventure. And what else? Exploration. Yeah, explore. Learn to explore. Yeah, it was Asia. What a lot of what we call China today, and, and all in other areas of Asia. And he wrote. Now, he wrote, and he made it sound a lot better than it was. But for any Europeans, when he wrote about things that they had, all right, pretty much is almost like robes made of gold. But their cloth that they had, it would feel good. Think about it. The Europeans are wearing some of them a lot of wool, fur. How would silk feel? Okay, so, I mean, this is where, when he's writing about this. But one of the other things that he wrote and he brought back was, and they had some of this during the Crusades also, were spices. And I have the question, what's the big deal about spices? Why do Europeans get so crazy over spices? Not just sugar, but other spices. Tastes good. Yeah, it tastes good. But there's not even more than just that. It's new. It's new. And here's where we have to look at it. If, it, if we are at that time period and we kill a cow. We're going to have a big feast tonight. And guess what we're having tomorrow for breakfast and lunch and dinner and on Sunday and Monday until we use every bit of that meat. And do we have a freezer to put it in? So come about Monday, Tuesday, and we're still hacking away on, on parts of that, that cow. I think it might start getting a little bit on the rancid side. But when, like for a normal family, you may only get a little bit of meat every now and then. And when you get it, if you have something like a cow or a pig that you, that you butcher, see the king, they get it all the time. But for normal people, you might go two, three months that you don't have meat. So that is why for you, you enjoy it. You don't let it go to waste. Even if it's a little bit rancid, you scrape off a little of that green stuff, cook it as much as possible. But would the spices help that flavoring a little bit? Or, for some of you, you may really like beef jerky. Okay? You use some of those spices, and you dry out that meat where you can use it then long term. Um, so that is where the spices really mean a lot more. It's not just, so, oh, I, I want to have it taste a little here. Sometimes it's the high flavors, it's for the preservation, so there's lots of it. So that's why for Marco Polo, it's, it's kind of where we look at that, what's Columbus looking for? One of the things he's looking for is a route to get the spices. 
Now, for world history, you should know the Renaissance, rebirth and learning. We, a lot of you know it with the art, so that's why we have the Mona Lisa over there. Uh, but she's looking at all of you um, here. But the one thing that we have that the impact for the America would be the rebirth learning science-wise. Uh, most of you know the story with how Columbus thought the world was round, not flat, but some of the inventions. What does a compass do? In the direction. In the direction. Tells where north is, which if you know where north is, you go east. But um, if you are out on the ocean, I know there's times that I go fishing out on the Gulf, and I, I sometimes am two miles away, where if it's clear, I can see land, but sometimes it's not clear. It is foggy. I mean, there's water, and then there's gray. And you might be, when you're in the ocean, three, four, five days, that you don't see the sun or anything, and it's just this fog. I mean, you just go from gray to black at night, and you don't know which, so that's where a compass would help you to know you need to be heading in such and such direction um, that you have. What is an astrolab? All right, there's the word astro in there, so what, what do you think? Stars. Yeah, stars. Uh, so what did this invention do? Star uh, Trek? Told you your position. Right, showed your position that you are according to where the stars are. So at night, you could figure out, um, and here, and this is where you kind of see, think of the plotting along with longitude and latitude, but you could figure where you are positioning according to where the stars are, and using the calculations, you can figure how far have you traveled. Um, and if you already know that someone has, has traveled over various times, you know the approximate distances is this when you go, go west across the Atlantic Ocean, you know if you're heading in the right direction that probably within two or three days you should come on this coast. You're not going to come exactly where you think you're going to be. Our pilgrims were aiming for Virginia. They ended up in New England. They were a little bit off. Okay? But that's where they were heading in that general direction. Um, that you have. And that's where you better have the, a good mathematician sometimes if you don't have enough supplies. Because you better hope that you get somewhere close to where you're at. The last thing at Caravels is were some of the newer ships that were that were made using a lot of the scientific um, knowledge that, that they had, and where the Renaissance, the idea of learning from other areas instead of in the Dark Ages, just whatever you knew, they would try to take parts that, that came from the Mediterranean and design those ships, which were then able to travel across the Atlantic. That a hundred years before uh, the Renaissance, those ships would not have made it. They would Columbus would not have been able to have that ship on there. Um, here's where you see the best stuff. All right, now we get to some other things in here. Hopefully you know of Black Death or the Black Plague, where you have, have it where some places you will have 30, 40, sometimes even 50% of a town that is killed, which for some of you here, the Silk Road, it traveled. That was one of the things that they got um, from Asia is where this had traveled. Now, we go and look at this, though, on the impact on the Americas, not just where the United States is, North and South America. If you were of European ancestry, whether it be Spanish, Portuguese, French, English, you are probably affected by the Black Plague. If you survived, how was your immune system? Yeah, pretty good. Because, it, and this is where for those of you that think of survival of the fittest, the Black Plague took out those that did not have extremely strong immune systems. So those that had the best immune systems and then passed those down also to, to their children would be stronger in there. So that's what I'm saying, how, how would the, the immune system be of the survival? Now, for the Native Americans, Native Americans have diseases. And here's where we get to the third thing that you kind of need to know um, with when it comes to the, the time period for this. The first is, again, your amazing fact of corn. The second is that there's all kinds of different tribes, but here's the third thing, diseases. When the Europeans, whether we talk about Portuguese, Spanish, French, or what we normally think of the English, once they arrive somewhere and they met the Native Americans, what usually happened with the Native Americans. Got sick. Yeah. And I know one, one, where, one place that I had read that usually within the first 20 years of contact with the Europeans, 80 to 85% of the Native Americans died of disease. Now, 
the Indians, they had diseases also. So they would transfer those diseases to the Europeans. But if your family and your ancestors had survived the Black Plague, could you probably survive whatever the Indians were giving you? Might give you like when we think of a cold, but that is where it would happen. It was not meant to be genocide, but there was genocide. Some of the things that you, that you may already know in, in history. When the pilgrims arrived at Plymouth Rock, they found this nice cleared out area. Anyone know why they found a nice cleared out area that made it really nice for them to build their village? Indians died. Yeah, the Indians died. Before that time, English fishermen had gone, been going along the coast. They came in contact with that tribe at Plymouth Rock. That tribe died off of diseases, and the other Indian tribes around there thought it was a haunted area and left it, left it alone. So when the pilgrims arrived at Plymouth Rock, here's a nice cleared out area. There's actually some areas that fields are that fields they haven't been used for several years, but there were fields there. So that's why they went there. Here in Florida, Ponce de Leon lands, those giant Calusa Indians, they greet them the first time. He comes back less than a decade later. And guess how the, the Calusa greet him then when he lands close to where Fort Myers, Florida is? As soon as they get off the boat, they attack him. Um, they end up going back. Ponce de Leon is actually has an arrow that goes through his Achilles. Seems weird to think of dying of this, but he would eventually die because of the infection and what would happen to his Achilles um, there before he gets back to Puerto Rico. Why were the Calusa Indians not so friendly with the Spanish the second time? Yeah. The first time they showed up, and when they left, a lot of people got sick and died. They didn't know what it was from, but they figured out, hey, those white guys, something's wrong with them that they gave to us. We don't want them around. And the Calusa Indians um, were able to stop a lot of things from the Spanish in there. All right, here we go kind of with the, the rest of the things that, that you kind of look at. All these kingdoms would come together and form to get together in these larger nations, the nation building coming about. Um, I know you... You don't study as much of that in world history because that's more if you were to take European history that you really study with each nation coming coming by. But by 1500, what was the most powerful two countries in Europe? Uh, Britain and Spain. Spain will be one of them, but not Britain. Who's Spain's rival for number one? And for a little bit was number one, but Spain will overtake them. So it depends on the no, Italy won't. Italy will actually. Italy's biggest time power actually may be Mussolini to today. France. No, France not yet. Portugal. The, yeah, the mighty country of Portugal. Why oh, that me? Yeah. Is this when they like colonized Africa? And this is where Portugal was going <laughs> after Africa, and that's where Portugal got a little head start for Africa, and. Um, or has started on Spain because they were there. Spain is, and again, by the time we get to 1500, you're kind of looking at things, Spain, Portugal, or about even. Number three is France, but there's a big gap after those first two. And then, no one ever said the Netherlands, the Dutch. Now, the Dutch will end up being one of the larger trading companies that, that you would have or countries that you have. And then number five, as a distant, distant fifth, is England. Now, don't do not get caught up on England and Britain. I will let you use it interchangeably. Most things that will have will interchange. At this time it actually would be mainly England, but this is where we have for the English history, the English will start taking over Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland to become the British Isles, or Britain at that time. Um, you don't need to get hung up on that. You can use English and British interchangeably. Uh, by the time we get to the Revolutionary War, it truly is Britain um, there, but um, don't get hung up on that. All right, now we get back to another thing for world history. We will have our drunk priest, uh, Martin Luther, who on Halloween, decides that he does not like what Brandon is doing, where he is being just very much of taking advantage of all the rest of you, where he was your 10% tithe that you were giving to him. All right, he was being very corrupt. Um, he had a lot of other little problems with the church, and he wrote 95 of them down and posted them on the board, which will then bring about two words that you should remember from, from world history. 
Reformation. What word do you see in there? Reform. reform. What does he want to reform? The church. church. Yeah, the church. Reform the Catholic Church. Which would make about Protestant churches. What word do you see in Protestant? Protest. protest. What is he protesting against? Yeah, the Catholic Church and their corruption. Ultimately, Luther will then start the very first of the Protestant churches as he breaks away what is our Lutheran churches today. Now, the Protestant churches, any church that is Christian that is not Roman Catholic in background or Greek Orthodox. In America, we don't have a whole lot of Greek Orthodox um, there, but we do have a small percentage there. So if you consider yourself Christian, you're Baptist, Methodist, Assembly of God, Presbyterian, Lutheran, um, Episcopalian, I mean, anything that is Christian that is not Catholic or Greek Orthodox, you are Protestant. Okay? And it came from, I mean, breaking off of of what was, eventually, was originally the Catholic Church. Those of you that go to some churches that maybe have deep, deeper Orthodox um, there, you may read, read on certain things that you have where they even talk about to the Holy Catholic Church, even though you're not Catholic, as you're reading with, with things um, there. And that's where they broke off. Now, what is the impact for America here? Some of these Protestant groups will end up coming to America. And you even look on the other side where we had had about four Baltimore, this the fighting that we would have between these different groups will end up having it where um, some of the Catholics will end up coming to America. Um, this chart on here kind of shows a, bre a breakdown. And you, you look and see where the early Christian church was, the Roman Catholic church comes in there. We have the Great Schism um, in there where we have the Eastern Orthodox and the Catholic church uh, breaking off of that, but then after that, you see on here, this is where for America, the Anglican Church, which becomes Episcopal, and their Congregational Baptist, Episcopalian, Methodist, and kind of breaks down where churches have kind of broken off of other churches to form um, various Christian, Protestant churches that, um, that you have. All right, hierarchy. What, is, what does a hierarchy mean? order of power? Yeah, the order of power. And who is on the top in the British? Yeah, the king. Yesterday when we had our royal family here, we have the king. And you kind of go down and you see in here where, where you have the knights. I mean, we'll have our bishops with the churches all the way down to, to where you'll have the, the serfs or the very lowest people. Now, within the royal families, what does Prometheus and Turner mean? What, or what was it? Hold the son, got everything? Yeah, hold the son, got everything. So we got everything when dad died, hold the son. What about the other sons? What did they do? What did Brandon and Ben do? Plot, plot to kill us? No. No, you all are good. You did not plot to kill. But. Like a priest and a knight? Yeah, that's where a lot of them became priests and knights. And here. All right, for daughters, remember you got nothing. You had to try to find your own prince. But here's where I was kind of getting in the influence on America. What if they came to America and explored other areas? And this is where the impact of that comes to America. Um, let's see. Um, well, I do have the reflection questions again here. Make sure, this is where for this semester now that we're cha changing things a little uh, and stepping up a little bit. Make sure you're writing everything in full, complete sentences. No pronouns unless you have already written what it is. Even though you have to assume, for some of you that's not hard, that I know absolutely nothing except for what you write um, there. Do not write the question and then the answer, but as you are writing it, you will probably include some of the question and your answer um, for this. Um, Michelle. Um, since we are a little bit later with this, yours won't be due on Monday since you have the brink leave. We'll make it due on Tuesday. Um, we may end up postponing everything along the way the next couple of days. All right. Um, you can go ahead and turn the camera off now. Thanks.